that's where teachers don't feel supported is because it's the clipboard warriors, right? Yep. And we come and I checked off what I saw and then I left. I'll be back in December. Well, what is the teacher says it learn from that? Welcome to the Teacher's Ed Podcast, a place where the best and brightest in education come to be inspired, to learn, to connect, and grow. As always, I want to start by thanking our sponsor, Be Well Teacher Box, a gift box to help educators focus on their well-being. By using code Teacher's Ed, you can save $7 off your box. If you haven't, please like, subscribe, and leave a review. This helps us get in front of more educators just like yourself. Today's guest, I am excited to have Jake Daggett on. Jake is an Ohio native who began his teaching career in Milwaukee in 2015. Having specialized in literacy instruction, Jake built a massive following on social media for his engaging and rhythmic finance lessons and evidence-based structured literacy lessons. Throughout his career, Jake has taught pre-K, first, second, and third grade and has recently stepped into the role of Foundational Literacy, literacy Director for Greater Holy Temple Christian Academy right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That part I love to say. Let me say that one more time. And he has recently stepped into the role of Foundational Literacy Director for Greater Holy Temple Christian Academy right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In addition, Jake teaches an online science of reading course for teachers, parents, and school leaders. And in his spare time, Jake presents nationally for conferences such as Elevate Your Classroom, Unlocking SOR, and Literacy is Life. Jake, I am so happy that you're here. Um, a little background, I've met Jake about a year ago, an incredible educator. Um, just the work that he does for students in the Milwaukee area, um, it is just a need across the country. So Jake, I'm honored that you took time out to be here. And thanks for joining me today. To be here as well. Thank you. Was the introduction good for you? It was great. And <laughs> I love that you just repeated that I'll be in your organization starting in yes. June. And that's the thing. Uh, Jake, Jake is so dynamic that we created a position at our school because we see the need. And one of the topics we'll talk about uh, today is literacy and you know, especially in, well, not even especially in Milwaukee, in the country, the United States lags in literacy so much. And if you turned on it, the way we act, you would think we are the smartest country in the world. But when you look at test scores and you look at education, we're, we're way behind um, the rest of the world. But when I saw the work that Jake was doing, we created a position at our school because we know that what schools are doing for literacy is not working. And I'm happy to have Jake here so he can share some of the stuff that he knows um, because I'm not a literacy expert. For those that have followed the podcast, my specialty is culture and relationships and those type of things. But I knew for our students to become the best that they can be, we had to put the best people in front of them. So Jake, tell me a little bit, um, just you know, your thoughts on literacy and you know, just kind of go into what your thoughts. I know you have a lot of thoughts on literacy. so. I just kind of want right. to open the floor so you can share because some some people are li some I know there's a someone that's listening that really doesn't understand the crisis that we're currently in when it comes to our students, especially in the Milwaukee area and their their reading levels. So I'm going to open the floor up and we'll kind of go from there. Absolutely. I mean, what's kind of nice is it's really awesome if you're listening as a parent, you've got maybe you're a, a nanny that that works with kids, maybe you. Um, are a, you've got a niece or a nephew. Um, I've actually got a lot of people that take our online course on really how the brain processes print and sound that um, our parents, you know, not even just teachers, uh, because I think what a lot of people don't realize, well, we've got 66% of our fourth graders that are not proficient in reading as of last year's data. Um, so they take all the fourth grader scores now, of course, you know, a lot of people may say, oh, well, did that, did that get the whole picture? But it, it's enough of a number to truly say, what have we been doing? And the truly like my first answer 
to people is there is a lack of understanding of how the brain learns to read. It doesn't learn to read in a lot of different ways. It really doesn't. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people don't remember how they were taught. But Eddie, when you and I were in school, like we did have phonics. I did have spelling. You know, back in the 90s, we did know this research. Um, and, and Scarborough's Rope came out in 2001, right? We've known the combination of comprehension and language acquisition. But um, unfortunately, you know, and then I'll pause, about 25%, if not more, in the 2000s started to adopt these big kind of flashy curricula that sold, um, leveled, you know, oh, you'll know your child's level and you can tell the parent the level, right? Um, and then also it was built on a system called free queuing. And people, listeners may be interested in this. We just passed a law in Wisconsin called Act 20. Act 20 now makes three queuing illegal in schools. You cannot have a curriculum that teaches that. And really what three queuing is, is what we've done for the past decade with these flashy curricula of, oh, I can look at the picture and then I'll just guess that the word is giraffe because there's a picture of a giraffe. I don't necessarily know how to read giraffe mm -hmm. if it's right here on a note card. And I know that the G makes it soft sound after that, or, you know, before the I. So the thought of, oh, but, you know, so it's that, right, that we had been using. And, and Eddie, you talk about ages of kids. Well, we don't realize that at first, right? Because it's these short little books. Oh, they read it fine. But then, you know, then, okay, we're in second grade. We want to read The Magic Tree House, right? We want to read, you know, Harry Potter. And so then all of a sudden, wait, but I can't do that because I, I haven't been taught the code of the language. So um, I, I would explain that as the main reason. There are, of course, as we've said, you could talk for hours about different curricula and different approaches, classroom engagement, um, leadership and decisions made, teacher resources, usability. But my biggest answer to that really is the methods we've been using don't align with the permanent memory pegs in the brain is really what it is. And when you think of, so like right now, you're going to be moving into a position where you can kind of lead and guide and be a part of the decision-making process. There's probably a school leader that's listening to this for them. What type of advice like, so, you know, I mean, perfect example, you're walking in our school and, you know, you've observed some things, you've seen some things. What advice would you give a school leader of like, to, how do they know that what they're doing is not correct? Because what I've seen when I've worked with school leaders on the culture aspect is most people in schools are just doing what the predecessor in front of them did. So it's like, this was the curricula that the board approved five years ago, we're going with it. And they've made these large investments that I feel like they're scared to pull back from. When you think of what are some of the things and signs that a school leader can look for to let them know that they may be going down the wrong path when it comes to literacy? Absolutely. And you know what, you make a good point, because there, there are a lot of investments that have been made. And a, and, you know, there's a little bit of ego there, right? Every human has a little bit of ego of, I ordered this for a district. I don't, it, am I going to come out and say now it's not evidence-based and I'm the one that had to spend all this money and now the boxes are in the basement, right? I can imagine that. And so it's really not about the gotcha. It's really about, I mean, I've done it with a whiteboard and a marker with, with, few supplies and just a scope and sequence and order of phonic skill. Really, if you are a K to two leader, a pre K to two leader, and honestly, with the data, even like we've talked about third, fourth graders, maybe still have some of those mm -hmm. foundational skill gaps. What they're looking for is an approach. It's a mindset of, are they learning symbols 
connected to the sounds. So when I, when I go into a classroom and I see word of the week, a leader might think, hmm, could it be a sound of the week? So that then I could read 20 words with that sound. Word of the week is based on memorization. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what happens, Eddie? When the brain runs out of storage on the right side, we can't memorize any more words. So suddenly, the flashcards I did at home, I memorized the picture of the. I didn't memorize the TH as th. Because how many words have TH? This, Mm -hmm. that, you know, bath. You know, we could do so many words if we learn that TH can be th or th. Then I could Mm -hmm. have 20 up there, but they're all on that sound that I have been taught. So what leaders can look for is, are we memorizing a word and then watching a video on a sight word? Well, suddenly I've spent 30 minutes, Eddie, and I've learned one word that's Mm going to leave my brain. But if I've learned, you know, if I've learned ah, and I've got some consonants in there, then I could do sat, bat, nap, cat, right? And I can say the sounds in them, and then I could write them and read them. Because I've been taught those symbols explicitly. I didn't discover them. Kids aren't going to go discover what SH makes unless they're taught. Mm -hmm. And so that's the mistake we've made, right? Oh, we want to empower kids to do inquiry-based learning and discovery and choice and agency. Turns out, though, kids aren't motivated by things they can't do. Mm Mm-hmm. So a lot of leaders will come in and they'll look for, you know, is there ownership of the learning? Or are they doing collaborative group work? Listen, in K-2 literacy, I hope not. I hope not. I hope that there is strong tier one. Get the teacher up there. Tell them what it is. And everyone's practicing. It's the Anita Archer. I do. We do. You do it. And you got this, right? Build the confidence. If they don't think they can do it, what are you going to do in third grade when there is group work? Well, now they can't participate in the group because now their brain's developed enough to to know that they can't read like their friends. Mm -hmm. In first grade, they're still loving the song. They're still loving the, the chanting of it. So you've got to get up there. The teacher truly, and I've talked about this a lot. Um, I have a, a running joke with my teacher friends of my first week in pre-K when I tried to wear a blazer. Do you want to know how much that blazer had to be dry cleaned? <laughs> you, were, you are sweating because you're so involved, right? It's tier one. You know, it's, it's not a, oh, well, they must need intervention. No, you're the intervention. Mm. You're the intervention. So no, you teach the sounds. It's not that they need, you know, or people say, oh, well, they should have been held back. No, they're in your room. Teach the code of the language. Mm-hmm. If you teach the sound, it's going to unlock it. Then they're going to find it everywhere. They become sound experts. Mm-hmm. So what leaders need to look for is one, you know, <laughs> is the, t- you know, teacher sitting in the corner in first grade. That's not going to do much. You should be sitting much mm-hmm. at all, right? Like. You're kind of like stressed. Like my fall in in elementary, I'm sweating. I'm taking every opportunity to practice those sounds. Write them on the whiteboard. Let's look at words with those sounds in it. Next week, we're going to add a sound to our tool belt. So teachers, that's where it's like, are we applying a skill explicitly taught? Or are we kind of just, what does Anita Archer say that I also love? Um, A bystander. You know, learning is not a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us, right, them sitting there while you're up there reading something, what are they doing? No, are they reading it with you? Are they discovering that has an SH too? Oh, you're right. What else has an SH? Let's read all those words. And then if I'm going to have homework, it better be on that sound that the parents know in the newsletter. Mm-hmm. Right. So so it's all connected to here's the order of what we're doing. It's not made up. And here's some activities that are going to match that. Yeah. And I and I, the, you know, hearing some of the things you're saying, it's like it ultimately when kids are engaged, 
and they're finding success, it encourages them to continue to go harder. And having a dynamic person that's up there and making learning fun, especially for those younger, I've seen in schools, schools look so fun from kindergarten to third grade. And the older kids get in school, the more dry and boring schools start to look. So it's like at that young age, like you said, being engaged, being active, essentially what it sounds like is you're trying to teach, what would be the best way to say it? Like you're trying to teach kids to be like literacy detectives. Like, you know what SH sounds like? Find it in all these words. You know what TH sounds like? Find it in these words. So it's not as much, you know, like a four-year-old, if you're saying the ABCs and they're singing it, they can say it and they know what it is. But what if you just put a uh, L on the board? Will they know that's an L if it doesn't come after a letter or before another one? So it's like, it's easy to memorize things, but we have to get our kids, from what I'm hearing you say, we have to get our kids to understand what the letters are, stand alone, not because I see it's a giraffe. Yeah, I, I can know what a picture of a, a three-year-old knows, a pic, knows what a picture of a giraffe is, but what's going to happen when they get that book and there's no picture of a, of a giraffe? Or it's, a, you know, the pictures are on top and all the words on the bottom. I can't tell that's giraffe in a paragraph now because I was so used to seeing it on the word wall and it's G, giraffe, and I see the photo of the giraffe, but then I see a G by itself, and I have no idea what that G is. And G also doesn't make J unless it's followed by I, Y, or E, Eddie, so it better not be on the word wall as giraffe. It better be a this goat. Is, this is why I am not illiterate, and this is why we brought you in, Jake, so you can teach not only the kids, but you can teach me as well. But and I know we. good you make a good point, though, of it, you know everything I'm saying so passionately is not of a blame or a fault, right? Um, but we have to be able to bring that ego down if we're a school mm -hmm. leader and say, okay, but what is the goal? The goal is not for me to now show how much I know when I, when I step in to this new role, right? The goal is how many children can we positively impact together? And part of that comes from, though, putting, putting yourself aside Mm -hmm. out of the equation because the knowledge we don't know what university they attended is the university up to date on the research are they still pushing back on oh you know eddie drilling sh that's boring well you know what turns out kids don't find things boring when the teacher does it mm -hmm. if you know you you've seen some of my videos i come and i say Ah, we have a new sound today, friends. And oh my goodness, I just put it on the wall and we've got to think, you know, I've, I've acting like I just discovered it for the first time mm -hmm. with them. And now they want to discover every time it comes up in the book, oh, there's the AW, there's the AW, right? And so that's because then we've added it and it's in a sequence that they can follow. They know all the ones before it. And now we've added a new one and now we can read words with that pattern. Mm -hmm. And so what a lot of it, Eddie, comes down to, I didn't even say this before though, is that knowledge base is not there. It, yep. it, teachers are seeking knowledge. I mean, why do I have a conference with 6,000 people? Because they want to be better for kids and teachers get a bad rap you know people say oh well they don't you know they're late you know they're lazy or they don't well they're not doing it they're not well but why because they don't have someone in mm -hmm. the, some of these districts don't have someone there to connect with the teacher and own the data with them that's yeah. what a coach does they own the data with the teacher right it's not a positional power move yeah. And I think a lot of it, like you said, is just not understanding. You know, I've been in school leadership for eight years and there's stuff in just a little, the few times that you've been at our building and we've done walkthroughs that like I've learned, you know, and it's part of it is the adults. And I think this is not even just literacy. This is just education in general. Adults have to put their feelings aside because where I see the biggest struggles in education is the egos of the adults, whether that is the school leaders, whether that is the teachers, whether that is the parents, whether that is the community, the school board, whoever. Like we, when when the adults have big egos, the, the students are the ones that suffer because of that, because we're not working together. And ultimately, I understand the business side of it. You know, right. you spend $100,000 on a curriculum, 
you have to, you want to get an investment of your money. I get that. But as a business person, it's like if I spent a hundred thousand dollars and I was going down the wrong road, does it make sense to continue going down the wrong road and being further away from where I'm trying to go? Or does it make sense to be like, you know what, we've made a mistake. And I think that is the biggest challenge that schools face, especially in larger districts. Because if you admit that you've made a mistake, people come for your job and people come for your position and people come for you personally because as adults, and this is kind of what you're saying with little kids, you know, little kids are okay making a mistake. As we get older and older, we're, we feel like mistakes are this bad thing and they're not. It's like, how do you ever learn and grow if you didn't make a mistake? Like, how will education and literacy ever grow if we can't just first admit, you know what? What we have been doing may not be the best for our kids. We have more data. We have science. We have research that proves there are more effective ways to do this. But in my unsolicited opinion, the biggest problem is that these big curriculum companies get paid a lot of money. And the people that make the decisions are probably friends with the people that own these companies. So it's, it's you know, we're making sure our friends keep their curriculum in. It's no different to me than standardized testing. It's like we spend all spring practicing for a test when we should be spending that same time still growing our kids to be ready for the next year. And I think that is one of the bigger challenges is that A, leaders have to understand that you may not be going down the right. It doesn't mean everything you're doing is wrong. And I, and I don't want someone to hear that and hear what we're talking about is like, you know, schools are just completely wrong because it's, it's, that may not be the case, and but there have, could be things we can do better. And many have made the shift. They just need support with that shift, mm -hmm. right? A school that I presented for in Philadelphia, absolutely enthralled with, you know, the shift from word wall to a sound wall, right? And how, you know, when you've got a word wall up there, Eddie, you and I grew up with a word wall. If I can't read, though, where am I finding the word? I'm not. It's a teacher point of view. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to be, you know, bringing to, to our school next year, the sound wall, right, has the symbol with the mouth formation where the student can find it. It's, it's a student resource. And so really, that's a mindset for everything we're doing that could be shifted. We, yep. and, and I like to call it the illusion of precision. Leaders really like to have a checklist and they like to walk in and they want to look for the things on the checklist, right? And so they want to look, is the learning target at the top? Was the success criteria mentioned? It makes them feel good. It makes them feel like they're looking for things that they believe mean the students must be learning. But really, take off the jacket, bend down, sit with one of them on the carpet, and hear them read. Hear them decode. Hear them know why a CK is followed by a short vowel. Do you know? They do. Mm -hmm. That's the learning. In elementary school, there's about 20 learning targets every five minutes. So I'm not going to write them all up there for them to not be able to read. That's yeah. a waste of my wall space. So I call it the, you know, that's what I'm so excited to be able to do is, hey, I'm going to walk the walk. I'm going to walk the talk with you. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see me once a month with my clipboard. That's what, and that's where we're at, though. That's where teachers don't feel supported is because it's the clipboard warriors, right? Yep. In we come, and I checked off what I saw, and then I left. I'll be back in December. Well, what is the teachers doesn't learn from that? Yep. Yeah. And, you know, it's you and I have had this conversation, you know, just because there's compliance in a classroom doesn't mean there's learning, especially when you're talking about four, five, six, seven, you know, really, I would say through all the way through school, but especially in those younger grades, when you walk in a classroom and everyone is just sitting there dead silent. Like that worries me because kids should right. be engaged. Like these kids are curious. They should be having fun. Like I love to see noise in a classroom. Some of the classrooms that have the best learning are look like the most chaotic to someone that is stuck in the eighties, nineties way of teaching where kids should be in straight rows. You have all your words in the board. You're up on the, you know, the letter the alphabet across the chalkboard. 
and everyone should be sitting there quiet. Like, no, that, that means your classroom probably has a truce. The kids are like, Hey, I'll be quiet. If you'll leave me alone. Teacher's like, all right, I'll leave you alone. If you'll be quiet. And it's like, that is not learning. It's that not. is. And it's kind of like, I was just saying that Anita Archerism of like, it's not a spectator sport. We're not mm-hmm. watching anything we're doing right? We're going to put the sounds up there and we're going to see who can be loud and proud and really tell me what two sounds can that make? Great. Now you write it. You, you write a word with that sound. Show me, show your partner and let's read the words together and blend them across, right? You've seen my videos, Eddie. It's loud. Yeah. You know, and then when they go to their desk and you're going to tell them a word that has that sound, you better be hearing them process that. And I know we're, we're probably short on time, but my last question was going to be, you've got a son, Eddie. What did he learn to do first? Did he learn to talk first or read? Mm-hmm. Learn to talk first. We are, the brain is rooted in sound. Yep. We're not wired to read. And so um, with my course co-presenter, Holly Ely, she always says teachers are kind of brain surgeons. It's like a non-invasive brain surgeon because you're literally wiring the brain to connect the sounds they know to the symbols that make the sounds. Yep. They know the sound. They talk to you all day. Kids are loud. Yeah. Kids are loud. So help them sound out those, you know, loudly to process the sound. That's how their brain works. Yep. We're so afraid of things we don't understand. So we need to understand it. Yep. And we'll uh we're going to get ready to wrap this episode up. But the last question I want to ask uh, before we close is what can a teacher do now? And I know there's programs out there. I know you have a lot of things like, like there's a teacher that's listening to this, like, man, I need to learn more. Like, what are some of the steps that a teacher can do? You know, simple things that they can just start doing right away. I know one of the things you mentioned was making sure you have the proper, you know, word wall or the sound walls. So what are some of the steps that you would share with a teacher that's listening that's like, this is intriguing and I think I may be doing it wrong right now? What would you share with them? I use a blank, I use a blank PowerPoint. I simply follow a scope and sequence. You don't have a scope and sequence, reach out to your leadership, right? What is a phonics scope and sequence that I can follow each week and I can teach those sounds to my class, right? You don't need, you know, there's plenty. UFLI is my favorite one online. Free PDF. Follow the order, right? Put those sounds on a PowerPoint and drill those sounds with kids. Give them a whiteboard. What can you write? Write the symbol that represents the sound I say. Ready? Ah. Okay. Say it and write it. Show me. All you need is a whiteboard, a pencil, a paper, right? Now we're going to, uh, you know, get some Play Doh and we're going to, we're going to, push in the sounds we hear or we're going to use little poppets and we're going to push in the sounds that we hear or let's use our fingers root your instruction in sound sound is the permanent memory peg in the brain so sound is spelling and spelling to sound so if you can say bat right if they can say bat, then they should be able to take a whiteboard and also write that because spelling in those ages really is reading. If I can recall it, I can recognize it. So right now, all you need to do is shift it over to that sound mindset, right? What sound do you hear? Can we write that sound down? What sound do you see? Let's look at, let's see. Oh, my, you know, my, my mouth is closed. Mm. That's my M, right? M, mm. Say it and write it. Mm, right? Oh, let's mm-hmm. do that again. That would, you know, and, and get them involved. Get everybody doing it, is what I would say, right? It, it really is predictability, Eddie, yeah. predicts their ability to do it. So don't switch it up every day. You don't need to do these transformations where you turn the class into a rainforest. You really don't come in with a predictable way that you're going to do it and teach the code. Nice. Thank you, Jake. And I know there's people that are listening that 
are going to get a lot. And I know that, you know, 30 minutes is not enough to go through all the ins and outs of literacy. And I know that some other topics that, you know, Jake, I will have Jake back on again to go through some other topics, but Jake, before you get off, I want you to let people know a, where they can find you if they already have not found you on Instagram, but can you also highlight some of these conferences that you, and I know they're sold out. So if you're listening, you're too slow. But no, what, they're not. Would, no. Oh, they're not. OK. OK. Well, let people know. Let the viewers know where they can find you, where um, if they're a school leader, where they can learn more about you, because I firmly believe that the work that you're doing is going to help change, especially our school, but on a, on a bigger level, because you're able to get in front of other educators, because what I have learned from the little bit of time that I've spent with you is there are some things that once you see, you can't unsee it. So these things about the sounds, these things about X not being xylophone. Like to me, I was wired to think X should be xylophone. So did that, did that stick in your brain after I it, said that? It has stuck in my brain. And it, but it, it's like one of those things like once you see it, you can't unsee it. So we have to get as many educators as possible to see the work you're doing. So because they won't unsee it. So let everyone know where they can find you, where they can connect with you where resources, where everything Jake is, I want to give you the chance to let them know where they can find that at. Absolutely. So my website is engagewithjake.com. So because of engagement, that's why it's called engagewithjake.com. So um, you can, re there is a contact Jake on engagewithjake.com. I do sell some of my decodable resources on there. Um, I do have a couple sample videos and chants on there as well, but um, my conferences are not, uh, Dallas is sold out, but I will be in Phoenix on July 11th. I'll be in Nashville on June 30th and July 1st and 2nd. Those are not sold out yet because um, Nashville, we're actually having about 3,000. So we're about, we're, we've got a few seats left, a couple hundred seats left in Nashville. Um, I am going to be with Unlocking SOR in July. That'll be an online seminar, so you can watch from home. Um, and then if you're a Midwestern listener, um, I'll be the uh, keynote for Literacy is Life, which is a really fabulous conference right here in Milwaukee, actually. Um, and it's actually one, a really fabulous group. Um, Maya Smart who has a book reading for our lives. That's awesome for yeah. parents raising young readers. Um, so literacy is life. Definitely want to, before April 15th is when the early bird, I don't know when we're launching this Eddie, but this will get out um, before this will get out right before then. So if you're listening, you got a couple days left. Yeah. Literacy is life. If you want to join us in Wisconsin, um, you know, that's going to be a two day event. Um, and there's a lot of also, just really dynamic voices that Dr. Moncrief has brought onto that team. So that's going to be a fun one local. That'll be my first local, but yep. Engage with Jake.com. You'll find all the events there and you can reach out uh, through that. And what I will do for the viewers, if you're watching this on YouTube, I will make sure that all of Jake's information, all these links are in the comments. And if you are listening on the podcast, I will put all of this in the episode information to make it easy for you to find Jake. Jake, I appreciate you taking time out more than ever. I appreciate, let me read this intro, this little part of the intro again, because no. recently he has stepped into the role of foundational literacy director for greater Holy temple Christian Academy. So I am so honored and excited um, to be able to team up, work alongside of you. I've already learned so much from you um, just in a little bit. So I'm looking forward to just being able to put, some of the best and brightest in front of our kids um, so they can continue to grow and learn. And, and so our teachers can grow and learn and we can do better for the kids because what, what is, what we're doing in the country is not working. You know, and insanity is the definition of doing the same thing over and expecting different results. We're lagging further and further behind and um, the work that you're doing is going to help to change that narrative. So I appreciate you joining us. I appreciate you joining the team. Um, and if you have not, please like subscribe, share this episode with a school leader that you think could benefit from hearing this message from Jake. If you are a school leader, make sure you take time out to get some of these resources from Jake and get them to your staff. And as always, I appreciate you all for tuning in and we will see you all next week.